this, this breakout came about, and it basically develops the theme of this issues briefing, building future power, planning for impact in Wisconsin. We all understand we have been suffering environmental degradation over the years, and we are here because we care about the health of our environment here in Wisconsin, and of course that means we care about our health, because our health is dependent upon the health of our environment. Uh, and what we are presenting here today is all grounded in our lead positions. I believe the lead positions from the national level were mentioned, uh, and you will see right here on this slide, which will be available on the website, both the positions for, uh, that can be found for the state, LWD, oh, for the national, that's the top uh, web address, and the bottom web address is for our state positions. So I'm very glad to be up here today with four lead members, and uh, we hope we motivate you to participate in promoting our environmental issues across Wisconsin. On each table there is a green sheet. The goal of this uh, breakout is to get us all more or less motivated to participate increasingly. If there's one on each table, and your table, I have yours. I just want to get it. Uh, so if you don't have a green sheet at your table, move to a table toward the front of the room. And if you are so inclined at some point during this breakout or at the end to sign up to become a member of the Natural Resources Google Group, please do complete the information on this sheet legibly. So, and I will mention it again as we close. I think you heard um, our national CEO speak about doing things together and that is the purpose of the NR Google Group, is that we who are interested in promoting an environment beneficial to life, which is our foundational uh, statement among our program positions, that we all get engaged and do just that. So please advocate, advocate in your own name, advocate on behalf of our positions as a lead. Uh, one reminder, if you advocate as a lead, you need to get your president and your executive committee, or however your, your local lead is organized, to actually approve whatever your uh, positional statement is. So, again, we are advocating here today for a healthy environment and to build impact across the state on those environmental issues we all care so much about. Just uh, on this slide, you can see a set of issues, environmental issues we're contending with across the state, whether it's water diversion in the southeast corner, uh, groundwater contamination in the counties uh, up in the north part of the state. We have groundwater contamination in the southwest part of the state. These are not all of the environmental issues that we are dealing with across the state. And by not including more on here, we are not at all intending to diminish those issues that might be in your area but are not up here. The ones we're going to talk about today are up at the top, lead exposure, statewide and in Milwaukee, threats to ground and surface water, specifically the Enbridge Pipeline 5, up in uh, the Ashland Bayfield area, efforts to address PFAS, which we've heard considerable about in our news recently, uh, and addressing plastic waste pollution in Wisconsin, and finally, the climate uh, crisis. So today we are going to begin with Ann Batiza, who is a member of the Milwaukee County League. She's a PhD, she's a VP organization of our local league at Milwaukee County Watch the Court. <laughs> and co-chair of the Natural Resources Committee. Anne, go for it. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Louise, for organizing, for organizing this, and thank you all for, uh, for being here today. Uh, on, on your handout uh, that you 
we see um, at the very top are just three items that I'm going to be referring to during my talk. And the first is, um, are the links for um, the uh, positions related to uh, water quality. So uh, at the state level, we have a water quality position where we support water quality and quantity standards and support managing water as a natural resource. At the national level, we are dedicated to supporting water resources and uh, supported um, key legislation from 86 and 87, uh, the Safe Drinking <coughs> Water Act of 86 and the Clean Water Act of 87. Of course, we're involved in other ways as well. Um, so lead poisoning uh, is a statewide issue. And this is a map from 2016 showing the percent of children poisoned uh, under the age of six by county around the state. Now this map was created from the Department of Health Services Environmental Public Health Tracker that you can access. The link is on your handout. And um, essentially, you've got to go through quite a few steps, topics plus data, launch the data portal, then you choose the data set, and that data set would be childhood lead poisoning. And then you get to choose your geography. Is it the whole state by county, or is it each county by census tract? And I'm going to show you examples from both. Then you choose a topic, um, and the years. Are you looking at children under one or children under six? And um, Oh, I'm sorry, it can go back as far as 2007. And then you can choose either the number tested, the number poisoned, or the percent poisoned. So notice that poisoning is now defined as greater than or equal to five micrograms per deciliter of lead in the blood. And the highest category was left off the legend. I noticed this as a trend <laughs> uh, in other maps. Uh, for example, the the highest uh, level of uh, average by county, which is Milwaukee County, uh, is actually 10.14%. And you do have the option to pull up individual data. That allows you to check. And then um, this current selection now, highlighted in yellow, is Milwaukee County. So I just want to point out why this is a statewide issue. Uh, up in the north here, uh, that's Taylor County at the top, 8.4% um, of the 83 children tested under six were poisoned. In Sheboygan County, 9.7% of 620 tested were poisoned, found to be poisoned. This is from 2016. Rock County at the, on the southern end, 7.5% of the 983 tested were found to be poisoned. And in Grant County, over in the corner, referred by Grant County already today, 6.4% uh, of the 188 children tested were poisoned. In Milwaukee County, about 10% of the 20,662 children tested were found to be poisoned. And this points up, I think, an issue um, around the state because that 20,000 children tested in Milwaukee represents 2.1% of, and I just picked the Wikipedia population from the 2010 census. Whereas around the state, these other areas have a much less percentage, lower percentage of their population between 0.3, uh, 0 .3 and 0.6% being tested. Uh, and we'll, we'll get to why that actually happens, uh, that, that children are tested in the city of Milwaukee. So now we're drilling down. You can do this. You can do this for Madison. You can do this for Ashland. Uh, sorry, by county. And uh, here we see the percent poison between 2013 and 2016. And um, notice that the concentration of of the highest rates of children poisoned, which are the darkest blues, coincide with the most impoverished areas of the city. And the highest census tract, which is 64, which is highlighted here in yellow, 
have, shows 31% of the kids who were tested were found to have been poisoned in these years. Again, that part of the legend does not exist on the map. It only goes up to 24%, but if you pull up the data, you see that, in fact, there were 38 census tracts, and you, you can tell where they're located, above 20% of the children living there being poisoned. Um, so this suggests why Milwaukee mandates that all children under the age of three receive three tests before the age of three, and then there are other extensions for children getting tested through the age of six. Uh, so at a recent hearing of uh, the budget in Milwaukee, uh, the League of Women Voters in Milwaukee County testified, and we provided them with a handout that had this map on it. And um, we also listed all, all 38 census tracts on the back that had poisoning levels above 20%. Um, we asked for two things. One was uh, that we continue a, a program already started by the health department to go into the most affected neighborhoods and actually test children in their home with a preliminary <coughs> capillary test. And we asked for support for something called the Birthing Moms Proposal, which has been proposed by a coalition of different uh, groups in the city to, uh, to give Oh, to give uh, mothers um, a, a, a kit of uh, filters along with education before they leave the hospital with their newborn in those most affected areas. So lead poisoning has declined the time. Uh, this is just census tract 64, and you can see that from 2001 to 4, uh, the average statewide was about 30% poison. And now the well, the average for this particular time frame now is around seven and a half percent. But the track 64 in Milwaukee had 80 percent of the kids who were tested found to be poisoned in those earlier years. Now it's down to, as I said, 31 percent. So we have developed a roundtable for talking about lead with um, government, health, university, and community leaders. These themes emerged uh, that informed our testimony. It also informed a report that's on our website that we wrote up for those present. We're going to have a second round table coming up this Tuesday. Uh, we will be covered by um, NPR, our local NPR affiliate there. And uh, there are several kinds of pending lead legislation. Again, those are on your handout. Uh, and this AB 399 SB. Uh, 371, adding $40 million to uh, authority to loan out to people to cover half their uh, cost of replacing lead radicals is part of it. And uh, so I'll leave you with that, and thank you very much. Our next speaker is uh, Anne Chartier. Chartier, is that correct? Uh, from Ashland Bayfield. She's the president out there, and I will not spend any more time on introductions. Anne. Uh, yes, uh, my name is Anne, and although I'm up here uh, sharing information with you about the uh, Line 5, Enbridge Company's Line 5 in northern Wisconsin, I, this information was prepared by Joan Elias, uh, our natural uh, resources uh, chair, and I couldn't have done it without her. I'm, I'm learning very quickly a lot more than I ever wanted to about pipes. <laughs> and also uh, fellow board members are here uh, accompanying me. So I'm basically presenting this because I was coming anyway, but I'm glad to be learning about this important issue. This map shows uh, pipelines throughout uh, North America. And the one we're talking about specifically, or I'm concerned about, is the, the one that runs between those two red arrows. And the red one on the west side is Superior, Wisconsin, and the one on the east side is actually in Canada. It's Sarnia, Ontario, where um, uh, the product the petroleum, the oil, the gas that comes both from 
uh, Alberta, the tar sands that are so uh, beautifully uh, depicted in some of the first and the last of the <coughs> illustrations, the rest are, are mostly sad, but beautiful artwork that's very timely for us. Uh, you may notice that there are some other lines going through Wisconsin, and as we consider what to do about line five, uh, there, are, there would be the possibility of having uh, this, this gas, this uh, petroleum product come through, uh, avoid what I'll explain in just a minute, which an issue, an issue you may have all heard about, which is two pipes going from the Upper Peninsula in Michigan to the Lower Peninsula uh, under uh, the Mackinac Bridge, the beautiful almost five mile, mile long bridge. So, Keep that in mind as we move forward. This is uh, a, a line that better shows, the red is line five, and this is an organization that, that like us is concerned about stewardship and the environment, and this is a map they provided. And uh, it goes across all the counties in northern Wisconsin where we hail from. The quote is from the, uh, the representative of the National Wildlife uh, <coughs> Federation, and he basically was commenting exactly on that point I mentioned. And I can show you a little bit of, of maybe not, of uh, the video they produced a year after it was requested. Uh, Enbridge was reluctant to show what had actually happened when an anchor hit one of the two pipes that goes across the, the Mackinac Straits, and, and that connects the two lakes, Lake Michigan and Lake Huron, which I guess eventually used to be very separate. But uh, a, a boat's anchor hit that, and they, they were built particularly strongly compared to the other 30-inch diameter that goes across uh, Wisconsin <coughs> from Superior to Sarnia. But in any event, you see more of this, but it's kind of interesting to see, and there is no sound, so you're not missing anything. And now I have to figure out how to go back to where I was, which could be an interesting... No, no. No? <laughs> That's okay. You'll help me? Yeah, I will. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, while... Yes, I'll keep talking. Um, so you, you saw the, the, the map and the concern that basically the, it, the pipeline was built in 1953 before basically there were any regulations and companies could do pretty much whatever they wanted. And it was to replace boats that had previously transported oil from Superior to the east. I'm so sorry I did that. Uh, so uh, when we get to the next slide, if we get there. Uh, I can tell you that over half a million uh, <coughs> barrels of uh, crude and, and a little bit of uh, natural gas go through these pipes and it's over uh, 22 uh, million gallons. Thank you, perfect. So that's just a generic picture of what a pipe might look like and that's some of what's uh, what's transported, and what they've done is increasingly uh, increase uh, the, the pressure in those pipes. Basically, the concern is that the pipes are really old and, uh, and there's a danger of having spills. There have been many spills, 33 spills since 1968, and something very dear to us is what is happening in Bad River, which is uh, one of the reservations in Ashland and Bayfield counties. We also have uh, uh, the Red Cliff Reservation, and La Couture is in Sawyer <coughs> County, and we're <coughs> hoping to organize a ranch in Sawyer County. So all these uh, reservations are very important to us, but. Um, as you can see, here's an example of the concern in Bad River, which is that over time, and what rivers do is change their course. It, we've had two 500-year storms in the last few years, 
So it's gone very, very close to the pipe itself, and, and there's danger that the, the erosion and, and what is carried in, in the river could actually puncture the pipe and, and create a great uh, disaster to an area that is very dear to us. Uh, the uh, uh, Kakagan and Bad River sloughs are some of the most important uh, wild rice beds in the world. And so that's one of the, the concerns we have. Um, the Bad River Reservation has basically, how am I doing? One minute? Okay. Uh, <laughs> it has, a, has, has presented a complaint. They have not renewed the right to go through the reservation. And there are 49 feet of exposed pipe. There's some danger of, there's some odor that hasn't been identified. And um, so the possibilities are, of course, to reroute it, which is what they're talking about. They're trying to explore. Some people are letting them, some are not. They don't go on their properties. Uh, it could go through Canada, which would be more ex uh, expensive. It could follow one of those lines I mentioned in Wisconsin. Uh, many of us, if not all of us, would like it to be de decommissioned, but we understand that an alternative would need to be uh, uh, shared. But So we don't really have a position yet. But as you know, uh, there, uh, as a league, we have many positions that support uh, the decommissioning, the protecting, for all the reasons of protecting water um, and natural wildlife. And thank you. I am on next. I am co-chair of the Natural Resources Committee in Milwaukee County, and I'm on the state board as vice president. My topic is PFAS. You've heard about them in the news, given what has happened up in the Marinette Keshtigo area uh, at a fire uh, testing, a fire extinguishing testing facility owned by Tyco, a division of Johnson Controls. PFAS are very persistent chemicals. They're very stable. There are about over 4,000 PFAS among the 25,000 to 80,000 chemicals in commerce in the United States today. I will just simply say that data on the number of chemicals in commerce in the United States is very sketchy simply because we have not been hyper diligent about tracking what's out there. So we're exposed to multiple chemicals. I'm only talking about this group of chemicals. Uh, it is very, PFAS are very water repellent and they're friction resistant, and that has led to their use in many, many products, including things like dental floss, nonstick cookware, which you don't see much of anymore today. Teflon was once touted as a very uh, friendly housewife product <laughs> because you didn't have anything sticking in your pants and they were easy to clean. So anyway, because of their uses on upholstery foam, fabric, soil release, cosmetics, and electronics devices, they are incredibly widespread globally. So they're in our earth, in our air, in our water, and in our sewage sludge. In Wisconsin, they were hit the news uh, especially hard two years ago, 2017, when BIRD was finally uh, publicly announced by Tyco Johnson Controls that they were releasing through their practices water, PFAS contaminated water to the ground outside of their testing facility up there. Since then, water hit in entering Green Bay, ground and surface waters uh, have been found to contain PFAS. Uh, the State Department of Natural Resources has been doing some preliminary research on this, and they have found it places <coughs> you can see here. Uh, those of you who live in Madison probably have heard about this on public radio and in your press, uh, and it is in trial field and so forth. So, what does this tell us about human health? What are the possible effects? PFAS have been found in human blood since 1968. That original uh, determination was made by 3M, which was one of the major manufacturers of PFAS. They had that in their records, but they did not report it publicly. 
It does build up in human tissues with, and the environment with time and exposure, continued use of products containing PFAS. The health effects are, are listed here. You can read those. I think one thing that uh, is of great concern is developmental problems in children. Those are not well studied. Uh, the good news is PFAS can be excreted in the urine if you have it in your body. It takes about 4.5 years for half of your body load to be excreted. Depending on how much you have in your body, it'll take a variable number of years. So um, I think one of the things that we need to be concerned about is the number of products containing PFAS and their persistence in the environment. How uh, the mess up in uh, Marinette and Pestigo was addressed is of interest. It was only in 2013 that uh, Johnson Controls uh, Tyco installation up there discovered that it was PFAS were contaminating the wells in their site. They, in 2016, found that the, the wells on the perimeter of the site also showed PFAS. They reported that out in 2017. Uh, and finally, in, that was in November and in December of 2017, they uh, provided bottled water to all the neighbors. There were several hundred neighbors that had potential well contamination. Uh, since then, they have been putting in wells. They test at three different levels, the water at three different levels as they're doing uh, probes into the ground. And uh, they have stopped sending PFAS contaminated waters to the city sewage system so it no longer will appear in the sewage a sludge put out by um, Marinette and Pestigo. Johnson Controls uh, Tyco currently report to the DNR on a continuing basis. Addressing PFAS exposure is in process. The DNR, it, you have a website here, and there's also on the handout several references that I put together. It's not the exhaustive list that I used in preparing this. If you want more references, let me know. I'll send them to you. Uh, the DNR has been sampling water, and I believe it is in five different water bodies. And uh, they, yes, and they have been checking that they've been taking three samples from each of those five water bodies. And in the first round, they found contamination of all 36 PFAS they were looking for. Remember, there are over 4,000 of these chemicals. They found the 36 they were looking for, not all at all sites. In addition, they have been taking a fish sampling from one of the sites, and they have found PFAS in the fish. That means if we eat those fish, we eat the PFAS. Some states where regulations are pending are New York and North Carolina, and up here on this, the uh, slide I put the range of contamination that uh, above which contaminants are not permitted in the water. Notice how different North Carolina is from New York State. Uh, and these, these uh, levels are for one or two or a few of the PFAS. It's not for all of them. I assume from what I've read that looking at one or two, there's an assumption that this may apply. The, the other uh, contaminants are present as well. However, those are the ones that are regulated. Uh, the one or two, and they are uh, basically, as I said, persistent and non-reactive. Wisconsin is working to address the issue in a relatively short time frame compared to the EPA. The EPA currently has about a 10-year time frame that it takes for things to be regulated. And, um, I don't think we're willing to wait that long in Wisconsin. At least our, our current <coughs> administration and uh, DNR are not. So, having uh, taken the bull by the horn, shall we say, there, are two, there have been two efforts recently. There has been a water quality task force, which has been holding hearings around the state. That began in June of, mid-June of uh, 
this year. The report is pending. It uh, is basically being led out of the uh, assembly uh, speaker's office. In addition, uh, we have an act that the League of Women Voters of Wisconsin supports called the CLEAR Act. Uh, that act, you can see, has both Senate and Assembly bill forms. And it is a very comprehensive bill because it is involved in setting state standards for 6 PFAS, which is not very common around the country, among states that are discussing regulation. And it requires health-based standards for drinking, surface, and groundwater. Some other states only apply to drinking water. Air emissions, solid waste, soil, and sediments. So what's pretty clear is that this Wisconsin legislation understands quite clearly that when you put something out there, it doesn't just stay there. It has the potential to move in any one of these different media. So that is a very laudatory uh, uh, feature of this bill. The other thing that's critical in this bill is funding. Funding for investigations, modeling sites, in other words, setting up modeling, testing models, getting data, analyzing the data, and uh, coming up with some good regulations based on that. Also, staff. You've got to have staff if you want to do investigations and modeling. And then also funding for state emergency responders. Basically, this bill supports moving to prevention and cleanup and remediation on a science-based basis. So, this is what we're dealing with. The CLEAR Act, SB 302, AB 321, was introduced in June of this past year, and it is in two committees, the Senate Committee of Natural Resources and Energy and the Assembly Committee of the Environment. Neither committee has had a hearing yet. The other piece of legislation, which I think is kind of interesting, was introduced uh, in June, the same day. Uh, it is two bill numbers higher than uh, AB 321, and it is before these very same committees, and the Senate held a hearing on it September 3rd. The League is against this, this bill because it is not comprehensive in terms of its real world appreciation as to how these compounds get put out there and have the potential to move through air, water, soil, ground, appear in sludge, and so forth. So it's basically uh, not one we're supporting because it's not real world. So I urge you to sign the green sheet and do what you can as an individual in your own name to support these bills. And if you want more information, please get back in touch with us and we will provide that to you. So I am done. And we'll go on to Carol Diggling, who has been working on plastic waste. Carol is a member of the Natural Resources Committee in Milwaukee County, and she's on the Wisconsin Le Le Legislative Committee and has done in-depth scholarly work on this issue. Thank you, Carol. Thank you. about AB, Assembly Bill 177. One person. <laughs> Two. Our committee. Because we're on the committee. You're on the committee. <laughs> AB 177 is a bill that repeals a previous bill that was introduced in 2015. In short, the first bill was what I think can be described as an ALEC bill, the um, American Legislative Exchange Council. Um, uh, some of the draft legislation provided by the Coke Industries to various uh, states around the country. And that passed in Wisconsin. That bill, um, get the down now. Get the one over to the there we go. Okay. Um, so AB 177 repeals the 2015 bill. 
And that limited local governments around the state uh, from regulating uh, single-use disposable plastic containers. And you can read the text of the bill. You can read, uh, you can find out who supported and who opposed um, AB 177 if you go on the Wisconsin State Legislature's notification system and sign up to receive notifications of plastic waste or plastic pollution. And they will send you notifications when bills uh, related to that come up, uh, which I did. And uh, that bill, AB 177, was read for the first time on April the 18th and referred to the Committee on Local Government, chaired by Representative Todd Novak. That bill hasn't moved out of committee. So I went back and looked up the 2015 Wisconsin Act 302. I called a nice woman at the uh, legislative notification service who, who walked me through the steps uh, to get back to when the first bill was uh, introduced and who supported it and who opposed it. The supporters were industry people. Polk Industries was one, Wisconsin Manufacturers and Commerce, the res restaurants, the um, food industry people. So uh, on the next slide, you can see that uh, there were 16 groups registering for the bill that limited local government. There were eight groups that opposed that bill. On AB 177, six <coughs> registered for, and the League of Women Voters of Wisconsin is one of the uh, supporters of that piece of legislation. The city of Milwaukee also was. So I contacted <coughs> Rick Myers at the city of Milwaukee. He's the uh, the Milwaukee Sanitation Services Manager, and he said to me, I asked him why did the city of Milwaukee support that bill? And he said, AB 177 would restore the ability to decide at the local level through our duly elected mayor and common council members whether or not to restrict, ban, impose fees, or regulate single-use disposable items issued in use in our political jurisdiction. Bottom line, they have responsibility for managing single-use plastics as waste. The state spells that out. And yet, they can't do anything to facilitate doing it effectively. So it presents a problem for local governments around the state to do their job. So I, you know, I did some other digging here, and I was, I guess, astonished at the magnitude of a problem that these plastic single-use wastes present. The volume that we're finding in the oceans, the impact on sea life, um, the simple Things like driving our car with asks, or the rubber tires rubbing off. We have to buy new tires every so often. All of that is getting washed into rivers. The rivers around the world are a conveyor belt. So the issue is big, and the industry is ramping up production around the world. And I put in, Wisconsin industry and business seem, seem to be working at cross purposes with government here. So we have to address this waste stream, but it is going to take everyone. It's going to take the manufacturers, businesses, government, and consumer policymakers <coughs> sitting around the table 
some kind of a blue ribbon committee at every level uh, to solve it. And we haven't begun. Our last speaker is uh, Dr. Ralph Peterson, Dane County Member of Climate Crisis Subcommittee. I just want to point out that if you think about what we've been talking about, PFAS led, uh, the pipeline up north, so forth, all of our topics today actually lead to climate crisis. The stock materials used for making PFAS, the stock materials used for making plastic are petroleum derived. The pipeline five moves the stuff and lead itself has come into our environment in significant degree until the mid 70s through the manufacture of tetraethyl lead, which was an anti-knock ingredient added to gasoline. It is still used in tractors and some heavy equipment that uses gasoline. So uh, Dr. Ralph Peterson will pre speak to us on the climate crisis. The, um, first of all, I want to say that this is what we are doing is consistent with and based on the policy statements that have come out of the National League on the climate crisis that basically is saying the League believes that climate change is a serious threat facing our nation and our planet, and we need to do it, and we need to support what we can to protect public health and the, the overall integrity of the global, global ecosystems. Um, you can go to this website, the national website, to get that information. On that website, you'll also find an interesting uh, little ditty called the Climate Toolbox, where you can actually uh, look at your own energy use and assess how much impact you are having on climate individually, or your neighbors are having cli uh, climate individually, if you don't want to look at yourself. Um, we looked at it, uh, the uh, climate, the idea to go to a climate uh, series of forums came out of the uh, annual meeting from our league last year. In, in the past, we've had numbers of forums that have been on different topics throughout the year. This year, we chose to, uh, this last year, I should say, we chose to look at two broad topics. One is climate change, and the other is what makes democracy work. Um, when we did this, we saw the problem as being how we saw it as an immediate emergency. We needed to develop understanding and we needed to understand what we can, how we can address the issue, and also what is already being done to try to address the issue. Um, we wanted to uh, comprehend the realities and the causes and understand the causes, not just believe in the causes, but understand the causes. And we have, want to have an open and honest dialogue on ways to address both climate, climate change on the globe and on uh, our local region. One of the first things we did was we decided to come up with a logo. And this is a graph that we developed. Uh, it's based on a, uh, just a, something that looks more like bar scan code that came out of the Hadley Center in the UK. Um, but it is showing not only in color, but also in the, as a, uh, histogram, the average global climate change over the last 150 years. Uh, the vertical scale on here is about two and a half degrees Fahrenheit. And a couple things are very, very evident. One was that uh, climate change is a relatively new phenomenon. Uh, the acceleration of climate change occurred uh, right at the end of World War II. Um, and may in fact have been partly precipitated by the increase in CO2 out output due to the industrialization during World War II. Um, that's somewhat speculative. But you can see without a question that the overall global climate is warming and it's continuing to warm, warm at rates we haven't seen before. Uh, we've used this chart for a number of things. Uh, one is to look at a little bit of the history of climate change and climate change research. Um, Climate change research really started with the International Geophysical Year um, in 1958. So we had not, before that time, really studied the two-thirds of the left-hand side of the chart. Also, 1958 was the first time we started to get 
CO2 <laughs> observations from Mauna Loa, which is the global standard for carbon input and the impact on climate. Um, and uh, the IPCC <laughs> reports, those first reports started to come out in the 1990s when we were getting those first evidence. So you can see some history going along with what we observed in the atmosphere, but noting also that uh, the impact of CO2 on, on the climate is increasing. Uh, what are we doing? Uh, we have a subcommittee to implement a one to, we're hoping, two year program of activities to educate, inspire, and encourage the league members to understand and work to mitigate the crisis. Uh, through public awareness and public-private action to reduce carbon emissions, uh, carbon em emissions and other, uh, quote, greenhouse gases, and to help uh, build resilient, resilient communities. Uh, the reaction from the Dane County League was very positive. Uh, we had between 14 and 16 people who signed up to be on the uh, subcommittee. And there's been a troop of about 12 of us who've been week, meeting weekly since June uh, to work on these uh, these four forms. Our first challenge was meeting in late June, being told we had a form at the beginning of September. Um, so pulling that form together in a different venue that we never had before. Uh, there have been some logistical challenges, but uh, we've had very good attendance. Uh, why, what are our strategies? Uh, design and implement this four part climate crisis series. Uh, create, develop, distribute study materials in a lot of different formats for people to look at. In the process, we're uh, discovering how computer literate or illiterate uh, our members are and how to meet the needs of both the computer literate and the not literate parts of the community. Uh, we've created a blog called the Climate Co uh, corner on the league's uh, weekly e-newsletter. Uh, it's updated weekly with a different topic of interest, so we're con continuing to refresh that. Um, networking with climate action allies, uh, lots of them around uh, this, uh, the Madison area. Uh, implementing promotional campaigns, uh, press releases, information on uh, social media, uh, and targeting outreach to communities which normally don't attend the league meetings. Uh, it's something we want to do more of. And also in this area, we want to reach out to other leagues within the state uh, to get their interaction. Uh, what have we been doing? What are our past and current forms? First form was in September, uh, Why Climate Change is Public Health Emergency, uh, bringing in a pediatrician, a research pedi pediatrician, research and practice pediatrician from the university, looking at uh, how to understand climate change impact on public health, why it is considered by many physicians to be an emergency status, um, what are the public health effects, what populations are at risk, uh, the roles of policymakers, and what we as individuals can do. Um, all of the forms are included a little bit of a uh, science, climate change science primer, uh, which I do to try to get people to understand not only that, CO2 is increasing, but why is that affecting our atmosphere and uh, and the global and local climate climates? Uh, next form is going to be beginning of November, uh, looking at uh, why global governments matter, looking at what is being done uh, to help develop uh, sustainable programs, uh, including both representatives from UW and from Dayton County and Madison uh, itself. In February, we're taking advantage of the uh, quote unquote slack time for farmers, uh, looking at uh, agricultural impacts and solutions, trying to reach out to the agricultural community within Dane County uh, to look at both what are their, their contributions to climate change and what actions are they taking to try to mitigate that. Um, and the spring farm has two possibilities and we're and like some input, your thoughts on this. Our initial thought was uh, impacts of climate change on our water. 
uh, study the impacts of increased precipitation, heavier precipitation, as you can see in the chart at the bottom, uh, the in number of extreme events of heavy precipitation over Wisconsin has increased substantially uh, in the last uh, three decades compared to the previous time before that. Also getting into questions of water quality and so forth. But as we are seeing things like the announcement that the state is creating a climate change task force, that you're getting more recognition of climate change and its impact this last year, we are thinking we may delay that until the fall and instead have a last part of dealing on developing climate change action plans, building upon what has been done in some communities within Dane County that can be spread out into uh, other communities around the state. Um, how can you access? We want to get more involvement from the local leagues. How can you access? If you're local, you can attend the, the forums in person or you can drive into Madison if you're not too far away. Um, we are trying to develop a live stream capability for the farms. It's a new technology for us. There have been some positive and negative wrinkles in this process, but we're working at it, and we uh, will, when we get things moving better, we will let the other state leagues know about that and how to access it and so forth. Uh, we do have videos online of the presentations at our uh, at the forum, so those can be easily accessed along with the resource materials. Uh, resource materials. Uh, the climate corner blog is there already, and uh, if you get information about the climates and the uh, climate forums and the materials at the uh, Dane County League site, uh, one of the questions that also came up was what role should the state league play in this as a coordinator? Not only in uh, possibly providing some guidance about live streaming, how can we all do live streaming of forums so that we can share those across um, uh, our local leagues, but the general question of climate change is not local, climate change is global, climate change is statewide. We have to address that uh, consistently. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? Yes, over here. I'm a journalist for the Capital Times newspaper. I write about wildlife. We are, I am appalled not to hear this topic in your environmental advocacy. There are a million species, that's half of the identified species on Earth, going extinct right now. So let me give you some statistics. 60% of mammals on Earth are livestock. Livestock, the, the slaughterhouses in this country and across the world are between 20 and 50% cause of climate change. Yep. We're in a dairy state. Right. Dairy is huge in climate change and biodiversity loss. 60% are livestock of mammals, 36% are us, and 4% are all the wild mammals left on Earth. Just Thank absorb you. that. We cannot reconstruct this world from nothing. 70% of birds are poultry for slaughter. 30% are all the wild birds left. We've lost 3 billion birds in North America in the last 50 years. In response to your comments, which I appreciate, I invite you to join the league. I will <laughs> join, but I'm telling you. I hear you, 100%. It is being discussed. We have a vegan member of our committee in oh, Ohio County, and we have an annual get-together where we have at least only vegetarian and several vegan items. So we're moving. No, but I don't hear it here in your in your forum, and it is so okay. important to the survival. I mean, even the Catholic Church, the Vatican, met in February of 2017 and declared biodiversity loss co-equal right. to climate change as a threat to our survival. Right. We I need to you. work, but well, I want to say one more thing before, because this is so important and this is why I came. There is an election in this state held the second 
Tuesday, second Monday in April, every year in every county right. for the last 85 years, 50 years of it, it is the only advisory to the DNR, which is 90% funded on killing wildlife. Right. So we don't. You're see, talking about the conservation. Yes, Congress. and we okay. don't. We we need the lead to promote this election. It is hunters know it's conservation only Congress. five thousand hunters yeah. and right. trappers okay. attend. I I hear you, and I will. I will. It's up here, and it will be on my notes when I get to my desk. They decide <clears throat> and, uh, more and more killing every year. We are in real trouble. Oh, I, we understand that. Uh, there were other hands up. Yes, gentlemen here. Since the uh, fight against the cave XL pipeline at Standing Rock, there's been a furious effort by the state legislatures around the country to criminalize protests. Right. Yes. And there's a bill now which uh, would make it illegal for us to trespass on Enbridge property. That's already passed the state legislature and it's going to the Senate on Tuesday. And I'd ask you to show up there because it's going to make it illegal to complain about all the things we're complaining about. Okay, thank so you. I'd like you to okay. look at that. Okay, that, that's note two. Okay. There was another question over here, yes. I was just going to say that um, I'm from the Ashland Bayfield County League, right. and we partnered with um, an organiz a national organization, uh, Citizens Climate Lobby, CCL, and um, uh, they have been very, uh, CCL has gone to our municipal governments asking them to pass a carbon fee and dividend, and there's currently a legislation at the uh, house level, um, I don't know the name of it, but uh, it's been um, brought up for uh, review at the at the house level for I don't know about the last five or six years, and it's not passed. Um, but I, I think that's an example of collaborating with another organization, mm -hmm. and um, you I, want to speak to that? I, I just and the the beauty of a carbon fee and dividend is that it brings down faster than any other strategy, it brings down CO2, and if, unless we, you know, CO2 levels are now at about 410 uh, parts per million, and we need to get back to that 350 parts per million, um, and, you know, so I, I think there are solutions out there. Um, we don't have to really reinvent the wheel. I don't think we, in, oh, yeah. in, the, in the slides, I, at the end, there was a interacting with other groups. On our committee, we have one of the leaders of the uh, Citizens Climate Lobby. Great. We have Sierra Club represented. Great. So we do have not just an interaction with them, but we have fertilization with them. Uh, we are trying to start with the uh, concept that we have to educate and get people to understand, to understand the problem and understand what, not just that the globe is warming, but why it is warming and appreciate that so that we can then do more support and not duplicate what is being done by these other groups. So I, it's, it's a joint effort. It's not explicitly a joint effort yet. There are some, some issues about the 501c3 right. status uh, between the groups, but um, yes, we are looking into that. I would just like to add also that uh, I have been a member of CCL and one of the things I learned that I think is very important in the state of Wisconsin is that the state of Wisconsin continues to burn coal to produce its electricity. We should stop burning coal. We know that, no one. So. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Um, is Senate Bill 302, is that Dave Hansen's bill? Senator Hansen's. Senator the, Hansen. Uh, the name, the, uh, the name he, strikes a chord, but I will He represents not. Marinette and Peshtigal and Ocano County and into Green Bay. Give me your name and I'll get back to you. Okay. On that. Well, I can just check with him. Okay. But if it is, he has talked about how challenging it is to even get these bills heard. I understand. That, that's why I put And up. that's why we have to call. That's right. And really push the leadership of both the Senate and the Assembly to hear these bills that can make a difference for right. our planet. That's, that's our plea. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? 
Thank you very much for coming. Uh, please look at the green sheet if you would like to be on the NR Google Group. Our plan is to put out action alerts with succinct information about the bills that you can use individually to lobby your representative and your state senator to actually move those bills out of committee. They have to get out of committee to be positively, not just stopped dead in committee, to have any chance of passing in the Assembly or the Senate. So thank you very much for coming. Uh, we appreciate your hanging in here till the end.